Gremlins came out during that period of time in the 1980s when Steven Spielberg was busy trying to punish all of us for ever being children. He snuck melting Nazis into a movie bearing the same parental guidance rating as Garfield, Tale of Two Kitties, unleashed a family film about a shovel-headed, wrinkly scrotum alien with a voice like a haunted speaking spell, and hired the man who made the Texas Chainsaw Massacre to direct a big-budget spectacle about a child getting kidnapped by a television full of f***ing ghosts. That was all within three years. It's like the instant he solidified his Hollywood kingpin status, the first thing he wanted to do was scare the s*** out of children. Gremlins was originally a straightforward horror film until Spielberg climbed on board as a producer and decided to turn it into a family-friendly black comedy... Thick and heavy. Would 60 gallons be sufficient? Christmas movie? About slapstick monsters joyously murdering pe- Jesus, what the hell is this movie? Well, I'm glad you asked, rhetorical incredulity. Gremlins, while definitely a movie about all of those things I just mentioned, is also a nuanced character study about a developmentally stunted man-child who is terrified of sex. Billy, the wet noodle at the center of this demon fantasy inexplicably aimed at children, is an adult living at home in his parents' attic, which he's carefully decorated with science fiction comics and issues of Fangoria magazine. That's fine for an antisocial 13-year-old, but Billy's clearly somewhere in his 20s. His best friend is Corey Feldman, who in 1984 had yet to graduate into the reptilian dancing skeletor you may have accidentally seen on YouTube. Nope. Back in Reagan's America, Feldman was still in middle school. Billy spends his free time reading 3D comic books with a 12-year-old in his parents' attic. In the first scene in the movie, we see Billy's dad doing some Christmas shopping in what appears to be the opium district of the city from Blade Runner. He settles on a curiosity shop run by a standoffish Chinese man where he more or less steals Gizmo, the adorable progenitor gremlin with the voice of Bobby Generic, <laughs> as a gift for his son. Everything about his body language in the transaction suggests that this is a gift for a little kid. Look, I've got to have him. It's a present for my son for Christmas. It's exactly what I've been looking for, and I've been everywhere. I'll give you two hundred dollars. That's two hundred dollars. Why else would he be so urgent about buying a singing rabbit for his son unless his son was eight years old? Gee, maybe because his son is a grown man who reads comics in his room all day long with a seventh grader. Billy even reacts to the present like a kid being bribed for his affection by an absent father. It's a puppy, isn't it? Later, we see that there's a single giant stocking hanging above the fireplace that's loaded with toys. Nobody else lives in that house but Billy and his parents. He doesn't have any younger brothers or sisters. That stocking has to be Billy's. That robot is for children, Billy. Children. You're old enough to be drafted. When Gizmo starts blasting out dangerously psychotic offspring like a t-shirt cannon, Billy takes one of the middle school science teacher to be studied. He's so locked into the mindset of a preteen boy that his concept of scientific authority maxes out at the guy showing educational films from the 1960s to a classroom full of sleeping children, one of whom is Corey Feldman. Feldman's literally the only person we ever see him hanging out with, apart from a brief scene where he's forced out to a bar with his asshole boss and tries to make awkward conversation with Phoebe Cates. Like everyone else in the first half of the 1980s, Billy is crazy about Phoebe Cates. The only other women in his life are his mother and the cartoonishly evil Mrs. Deagle. The bank and I have the same purpose in life, to make money. In Billy's mind, women are either snarling, overbearing monsters, or his mom. When the Grumman's cocoon, the scientist says they're going through lots of changes, and Feldman immediately says, Like my mother. <laughs> Get it? Because women are monsters. It's all reinforcing Billy's terror of intimacy. Even the rules of the Grumman's themselves sound like a missive against the spread of STDs. Keep him out of the sunlight. Keep him away from water. Don't ever feed him after midnight. That's like a haiku of sexual repression. The Gremlins, on the other hand, are pure id. They drink, stab, shoot, and flash their genitals all over town like tiny Irish gangsters. And the Gremlin outbreak just so happens to coincide with Billy finally allowing his relationship with Phoebe Cates to move beyond the let's agree to casually ignore each other's existence after nine o'clock stage. If you're not doing anything this Thursday night, maybe you'd like to uh, go out on a date? Check it out. The first time Billy encounters a Gremlin, it slashes his hand into a bloody mess. That was no Gremlin attack, friend. That was Billy masturbating for the first time. He finally let his id take over and just pulled a violent orgasm out of his meek sheltered penis. The Grumlins are his sexual awakening, vandalizing the town to vent his years of frustrated repression. Who are two of the first people the Grumlins attack? Billy's mother and that wintry old crypt part, Mrs. Deagle. The matriarchs have a skewed understanding of women. Understandably horrified by the murderous sex monsters he's unleashed, Billy has to regress back to his childhood in order to destroy them. They trap most of the Grumlins in a theater showing Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and then burn them all alive, which is just great. And then Gizmo defeats Stripe, the Gremlins' chieftain, by crashing into a skylight with a toy car. They literally kill the Gremlins with a Saturday morning at your grandparents' house. During Stripe's spectacularly horrific death scene, he melts into a pile of milky skeleton fluid that looks a whole lot like angry semen. The dog even gives a final pile of mucusy ooze a shameful look, as if he's just been forced to watch Billy masturbate to completion on a pile of Star Wars comics. Before Gremlins, director Joe Dante was best known for The Howling, which is a movie about violent monster sex. Spielberg apparently recognized Dante's child-terrorizing potential and asked him to make that exact same movie as a kid-friendly puppet comedy. 
because the 1980s were just, just incredible. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching my video about Gremlins. It's one of those movies that I grew up watching more times than I spent actual meaningful time with my parents. If you liked it and you want to see me talk about some more Spielberg movies from the 80s, like always, subscribe. There's a button, you can press it. It's around here somewhere. Even if you didn't like it, press it anyway so that you can unite your hatred and destroy me. If you thought I was wrong about Gremlins or you want to just argue with me about Gremlins or if you just want to just say whatever, there's some comments down there, there's a comment section where you can write them and we will read them just, just very carefully. It's gonna be great. <laughs>